um, first greetings to my young friends from the Ambedkar Periyar study circle. And thank you very much for having invited me uh, here today so that uh, I can share these ideas uh, about the new education policy, which as Kaushik has already pointed out, has quite a checkered history. It has been coming and going for several years. And it has also um, been uh, changing its format, depending on the kind of uh, attack that has come on it and so on. So I'm today, I can't take the whole policy, although what the cabinet pass, has passed, we still do not know if this is the full policy. Because we have got some uh, pages, some 80 pages of the last version of the policy with some changes. But uh, what I think is important for us to look at uh, in this uh, uh, policy is the ideas that they have on higher education. I'm going to focus on that today. And I'm going to focus particularly on two very significant concepts which have been used uh, in this uh, higher edu section on higher education and which emerge from the very first paragraph of the section on higher education. So I'll just read out uh, very briefly the ideas which they have put in, which is also for the first time it has been put in as far as I can recall. I don't think it was in the earlier section of the earlier version of the document. It says here, higher education plays an extremely important role in developing India as envisioned in its constitution. The constitution was almost missing in the earlier version, but this time there is a clear reference. A higher education plays an extremely important role in developing India as envisioned in its constitution as a democratic, just, socially conscious, cultured and humane nation upholding liberty, equality, fraternity and justice for all. And it says further down, the purpose then of quality higher education is more than the creation of greater opportunities for individual employment. Now, this is very important because, as I said, this was not present in the earlier versions. What they're saying now is that preparing people for the Constitution and for a society which functions as the Constitution had envisioned is very much a part of the purpose of higher education. So higher education is now a progressive concept and it's a social concept which is geared to creating a society which is capable of carrying forward the ideas of liberty, equality, and fraternity. Now, if this is the case, then this immediately contradicts or comes into problems with uh, the uh, way that this policy itself has been evolved or developed. In India, we have a society in which more than 86% of the population, that which we refer to as the Bahujan, the Bahujans who constitute the scheduled caste, scheduled tribe, uh, uh, OBCs, uh, the uh, minorities, particularly the uh, Muslims, and other deprived and oppressed sections they constitute more than 86% of the population of this country. However, this education policy, unlike all our earlier policies and unlike our constitution itself, does not carry any reference to the idea of the reservation policy. Now, the reservation policy, which is much maligned these days in the media and so on, was something which actually Baba Sahib Ambedkar had pointed out very clearly in his last uh, address, his final address to the Constituent Assembly, where he pointed out that the 
the uh, um, reservation policy is not an attempt to equalize or to create a level playing field for all sections. He made it very clear that since India and Indian society has actually prevented large sections of the population from having access to knowledge and the reference to the caste system is absolutely clear here that they were not the productive lowered castes were not allowed access to education so he said if we have to correct this now in an independent india and correct it we must if we want a society like the one which the constitution envisages for us, if we have to do this, then we must have affirmative action which discriminates in favor of those who had been discriminated against for centuries. I'm specifically using his terms, discriminate in favor of those who have been discriminated against for centuries. So there is no level playing field. You are very clearly discriminating in favor of those who have been discriminated against. And this is very, very important. Now, because in our um, uh, new education policy 2020, the word reservation is not used not once and what they keep talking about is merit oriented merit based and talks about a level playing field now it's very strange because why should how can you create a level playing field simply by creating a concept of merit in which everybody is said to compete. So you have centralized admission tests, you have centralized uh, accreditation tests, you have centralized assessment tests. And by centralizing all these tests, you say that we are creating a level playing field. But you cannot have a level playing field in which the oppressed the disadvantaged, those who have been kept out of all benefits of society, and the privileged and the advantaged caste sections, the upper castes, and the privileged, simply by creating these centralized tests, you do not create a level playing field. Because you cannot have a level playing field between the privileged and the disempowered between those who have got all the benefits of society for generations and for centuries and those who have been denied these for centuries. So this is the first and most important point that I want to raise here. By keeping out reservation policy, that is by keeping out affirmative action as defined by Baba Sai Mambedkar, and by introducing concepts of merit, which apply to everybody, you are in fact not creating a level playing field. You are trying to say that the oppressed and the privileged can compete with each other. All right, we'll come back to this later when I talk about the concept of merit as it has been put into the uh, new education policy. Because I believe we cannot have a concept of merit which does not include affirmative action. That is, there can be no concept of merit which does not include the reservation policy. So this is the first point. And I will come to this idea, as I said, this concept of merit, I will come to it a little later. But first I want to take in another very important concept when we are trying to understand the constitutional aspect of the new education policy, where we say that higher education is something which has a very important role to play in 
as uh, in uh, promoting the constitutional concept of education. The important thing here is the concept of autonomy. Now, autonomy is a word which I believe is being bandied about, very carelessly used, without discriminating or without understanding the various aspects of the use of this word and without understanding how this term autonomy has been used in the educational policy as it has evolved in independent India. This education policy, and I will uh, uh, refer to some of the, uh, the uh, historical aspects of it. The first reference to autonomy and basing education policy on autonomy, particularly on the idea of quality in education comes with the Radhakrishnan Commission on Higher Education of 4849, which carefully says that the evils that arise in our education system, and remember he's talking about a period when our education system and higher education was under a colonial rule. He says the evils that arise from our education uh, system is that this education system as it exists in our universities has no real autonomy whatsoever. No real autonomy whatsoever and has proved incapable of resisting pressures from outside. That is from outside of the academic sphere. Universities, says uh, uh, Professor uh, Radhakrish Dr. Radhakrishnan, Dr. Radhakrishnan says universities should be sensitive to enlightened public opinion, but they should never allow themselves to be bullied or bribed into actions that they know to be educationally unsound or worse still, motivated by nepotism, faction and corruption. In other words, the Universities must very carefully see that they remain autonomous from outside interests which promote nepotism, faction, and corruption. And uh, it's something where he says uh, the best possible constitution is one that allows the academic community freedom of thought. So academic autonomy is what he's focusing on. When we come to the Kothari Commission report, which is in 64, 68, from 64 to 68, this is extremely clear. The Kothari Commission is very, very clear. There's a remarkable awareness in the Kothari Commission on what the role of academic autonomy is in creating a sound, an important university structure. He makes it very clear that uh, the commission says that teachers and students, this is how he defines ac academic autonomy, teachers and students must have the freedom, and I quote, to hold and express their views. However radical, however radical their views must be, may be within the classroom and outside the classroom, provided they are careful to present the different aspects of a problem. We would like to see teachers practice more of it, that is autonomy and vigorously. We would like to see teachers practice more autonomy and vigorously. And teachers and students should receive all facilities, again, this is a quote, receive all facilities and encouragement in work, teaching and research, even when their views and their approach is in opposition 
to those of their seniors and the head of the department or faculty. In other words, autonomy means autonomy, not just for an institution, not just for a department, but for an institution, but for, sorry, for every individual working in those departments. Every individual working in the university must have the right to complete autonomy, even if it means that you're disagreeing with your seniors or when you're uh, disagreeing with the uh, people who are running the department. The Kothari Commission identifies three levels of autonomy for the universities. The first is within the university, what I have just talked about. Within the university, there must be the autonomy of departments and colleges and of the teachers and students working in them. Second level of autonomy is of the university within the system of higher education. This means there must be independence from administrative and financial institutions, including the ministry and the University Grants Commission. The University Grants Commission and the, and the ministry can only work in consultation with the university and the rest of the uh, higher education system. And the third level of autonomy, which is extremely important, is the autonomy of the system of higher education as a whole in relation to other agencies and influences. This would mean autonomy one from political and market forces, such as governments, whether it's the central government or the state government on the one hand and corporate and commercial interests on the other hand. And the second kind of autonomy of the entire system of higher education in relation to other agencies and influences. The second is after political and market forces, the second is autonomy from religious institutions and discriminatory socio-cultural tendencies. Example, caste, communalism, racism, cultural hegemony, and gender prejudice. Now, I think by now all of you must have realized that the idea of academic autonomy, which was being developed and evolved through our earlier education commissions, particularly the sections on higher education are really quite, quite different to what we are now hearing and what we are now seeing as autonomy. But I want to uh, point out two other points which is made in the Kothari Commission, which is very rich on this issue. The Kothari Commission says this concept of autonomy is not being put forward as a privilege which is being given by society or the state to the academic community. It is not a privilege. It is an enabling condition. Without this autonomy, the university cannot function as it ought to function. And the university cannot make the contribution that it has to make to society unless this enabling autonomy is provided to the universities. Now, this is extremely important. It says without this autonomy, and Kothari actually points out that your university may be organized on different principles, may be supported by public or by private agencies. But any of these, whether it is autonomous or affiliated, whether the in Institute of Higher Education is state funded or privately financed, it cannot be expected to contribute to independent thinking until the academic community has this independence, which we have just talked about. 
independence from political or market forces on the one hand or religious and uh, discriminatory socio-cultural tendencies on the other. Now, the other one other very important thing, because of this, says Kothari, the university is able to function as an autonomous institution at the heart of the society. Please remember this, an autonomous institution at the heart of the society. This is the contribution that the university makes to creating the kind of society which the constitution envisages for us. To be an autonomous institution in this sense at the heart of society is what allows the university to play its extremely important role in developing India as envisioned in the constitution. Please let us see this interconnection. It's very important for us to do this. Without this, uh, it's not going to be possible for uh, the university to function and Therefore, his final point, which the Kothari Commission makes is that the greater the autonomy that you give to the university, the greater must be the public finance that you provide for the university. Because it is this public universe, it's public finance, which allows or protects the university from being drawn into or being bribed as uh, Radha, Dr. Radhakrishnan had said, by other competing forces in the society. So it is the state which must give this autonomy. It is the state which must ensure this autonomy. And it is the state through the University Grants Commission, which is an autonomous body, although we've had a very sad experience with the University Grants Commission over the last few years, but it was this body which was to protect the universities, to protect their autonomy and to keep this autonomy there if the university is to function in a way which is to make it possible for it to contribute its very important role to the society. And because the university contributes this very important role to society, a role they cannot perform without full academic autonomy. Without this, the university will not be able to make the contribution it makes to society. And it is because it makes this contribution to society that society contributes to the protection of the university's academic autonomy. Now, let me, having given you this background, a very strong background of what academic autonomy is, let us now see how the new education policy looks at autonomy. The first thing is that the new education policy, despite everything that it says, is not talking primarily about the autonomy of the academic community, whether it be the teachers primarily and the students as the uh, people who are being trained by, uh, the, uh, by the university. What they're looking at is the autonomy of educational institutions from funding by the government, by the state. Autonomy is a word which has been used right throughout the new education policy 2020, throughout all its versions. The word autonomy is used to mean you are autonomous if you do not want funding from the government, funding from the state. 
if you do not want public funding. You must commit yourself to getting your own funding. And once you get your own funding, then you are in a position to see how much funding can be given to you from the state. We are already seeing this happening. Already the central universities are being asked to function on a 70-30 model. That is, they will be given, uh, they will be given a 70% grant out of 100% and 30% they have to raise themselves. How will they raise it? I hate to say this, there are only two ways in which you can raise it. You either increase the fees, which as we know are already being increased, and you increase it by other expenses like hostel and mess charges. We have seen how various universities have had long drawn out uh, uh, agitations against mess and free uh, increase, fee increases. Uh, of course, they say at some point here that uh, the university cannot in the middle of a student's course, increase the fees. But the tragedy is that this is exactly what universities have done. In Bombay, TIS has done this, the Tata Institute of Social Sciences. They did this when the government withdrew the scholarships for SCST students. They used to get a scholarship grant that was either withheld, they didn't say we've withdrawn it, but they didn't give it either. They said, what you do is you pay now and we'll reimburse later. Now, as we all know, and this happened when they started off by doing this with uh, the OBC uh, students, said that, you know, we will, uh, you pay now for your uh, scholarship and we'll give you the funds later. The result was that OBC admissions in TIS dropped by 9%. And when they uh, did the same thing with SCST um, admissions and scholarships. These are the post uh, metric scholarships as they are called with so that you can go to higher education. Uh, these um, are um, uh, um, uh, scholarships actually would have resulted in a huge drop again, but for the fact that the, uh, uh, the uh, students went on strike and this was a very long drawn out strike. Some things were re resolved, many were not, but I think I don't have to go too much into this issue because I think all of us remember that the reason why Rohit Vemula lost his life was because his scholarship had not been paid for more than nine months. That was one of the factors that was a very important factor for him and other students from the uh, SC community who do not come from privileged sections of society, who do not have the resilience to wait nine months. When we asked their acting vice chancellor at that point, what he would have done if he had not received his salary for nine months, he said, really, madam, that's not the point. I said, that is precisely the point. Because when you deprive a student who does not come from an elite background or a privileged background, when you ask that student to pay up for his living expenses and wait till his fellowship is cleared and the fellowship doesn't come for nine months, then you are driving students to disastrous consequences. And I think this is why it's very important for us to see that uh, uh, the, the moment you look at autonomy only as autonomy from financial support uh, from uh, the government or rather financial funding or grants from the government, then what you are doing is you are actually pushing students out you are excluding those students who do not come from, uh, uh, from uh, privileged sections of society. And we find this happening all the time in the uh, uh, 
in the new education policy. They say that they are going to have reasonable return on resources invested in, uh, uh, in, uh, in educational institutions by corporates. And you have reasonable return for uh, investments in, uh, uh, in uh, whether it's in colleges and so on. And for these reasonable returns, you are allowed to fix the fees. There is no regulation on the fees. The only thing which the government says is required is that whoever is running the institution will declare at the time of admissions that this is the fee that is going to be charged for tuition, for mess, for uh, uh, hostel, for other facilities like libraries, etc. The just that the fees will have to be listed at the time of admission. But we all know that it doesn't always work like this. I think you're all familiar with the long agitation of the Jawaharlal Nehru University Students Union against fee hikes, which were done mid term. And they actually pointed out that 47% of the students who were doing research at uh, uh, JNU at that time would have had to actually cease their research because they would not have been able to pay the new fees, which were more than double of what they had been paying. And this was done mid-term. And this was a central university. This wasn't even a private university. And the cases we have enough uh, uh, examples, I think you in Chennai know of what happens in many privately funded institutions. I know that in Punjab, where they have a lot of private uh, funding of institutions, I mean, the whole thing is a disaster. They can change the, uh, um, the fees at any point and at any time. And the students have no uh, uh, recourse to any uh, set, uh, redressal of their grievances. And this is when, I want you to look at this, this is when the government itself is collecting a 3% cess for education. They've been collecting this for years. And now in the last two years or so, it has been increased to 4% by including health in it. So assuming that we are not getting 3% now, maybe 2.5%, the government is taking a cess from every taxpayer for its contribution to higher education and then not letting that contribution go towards the students or go towards those very people who will give us the who will provide for us the kind of constitutional values and the kind of constitutional uh, 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 India envisioned, envisioned by the constitution, if that is not being contributed to because public funding is being withdrawn gradually. I don't have to go into the 6% and all that. You all know what is happening there. And public funding is going away, is being withdrawn. And increasingly what we are seeing is that the autonomy of the universities is being, of the university academic community is being taken away as more and more the emphasis of the governance of the university now is going on to managerial skills, is going on to people who will determine financial, whose skills are in finances, how to manage the finances of the universities, how to manage the university, how to start introducing, how to start outsourcing various activities of the university, how to start uh, uh, handling the finances of the university by starting uh, self-financing courses, by starting, by letting out the land and the physical assets of the universities to 
industry and to other religious institutions also, to other kinds of institutions. All these things are being done because the universities are being told, you please now start generating your own resources. If you want to generate resources for research, then please go into alliance with industry for uh, uh, research and so on. So that your research is now going to be determined by the person who's funding it, not by the results of your research. We know that the American system, which in fact, this new education policy is based on the American system. And we know that American system has had very, not just two or three independent universities like Yale and Harvard and Princeton and Stanford, those are thrown at us all the time. But the way in which the private universities function and big private universities also, Columbia, for example, is one of the most important universities. Well, Columbia went into a research agreement with BMW, the, uh, the uh, car manufacturer. And the result was that the car manufacturers representatives were looking at how research is going to carry on, looking at how research is going to be handled, who is going to get grants, what are the areas of research. Those were all areas which were suitable for BMW's production requirements. So what happened was this kind of PPP between industry and research was being was being done the university's physical assets and the university's intellectual assets were being used for developing research for bmw and not for the good of society per se now when you see things like this happening then we have to realize that you are not going to be able to, uh, uh, to develop the kind of uh, education system which your society really needs if you are to have the kind of society envisaged by the constitution. Because here, autonomy is now con contained completely within standardization. And that standardization is a standardization of norms, of admissions, of uh, uh, assessments, of uh, the, uh, the contribution that you make. All of this is done by centralization, which also has another issue, which I think in Tamil Nadu you are very aware of and you're probably familiar with, is the uh, uh, central government's uh, imposition of its own uh, views and uh, ideas onto the uh, state government, which is in fact against the federal principles of the constitution itself. But I want you now, I just want, uh, uh, before we go any further, uh, and I think I, I might be nearing the end, do I have uh, some time? Uh, Kaushik, do I have some time? Anyway, I will continue, not waste my time on this. Uh, we yeah, will, yeah. Uh, we'll ta yeah. I'll take up, yeah. yeah, I'll take up the concept of merit, which I, again, which I had referred to earlier. The new education policy claims that it is doing everything on the basis of merit. It is admitting students on the basis of merit. It is it is training teachers on the basis of merit. It is appointing teachers on the basis of merit. It is organizing its, uh, uh, its teaching methods to, uh, to uh, enhance merit. And it is going to assess students on the basis of merit. In this concept of merit, nowhere do we see that merit is not a concept which has dropped from the skies. Merit is a concept which evolves in our society. Merit is a concept 
which is a concept for a particular society. In America, for example, why do you have that strong Black Lives Matter movement at the moment? Because American society has a huge backlog of racism and racial prejudice. And therefore, American society's concept of merit has to take into account that racial prejudice. And therefore, there is a very strong component of uh, uh, affirmative action on the basis of race in America. And this is something which we, of course, don't look at when we are taking the whole system, when we're bringing it down. Why don't we recognize that in India, we have a concept of caste oppression, caste uh, 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 backwardness, which has been imposed by the dominant castes on the lowered castes, as Dr. Ambedkar used this wonderful word, he called them the lowered castes. And uh, when we are looking at merit without looking at this, then what we are doing is pretending as though merit has dropped from the skies. If merit drops from the skies, then let me tell you, we don't need universities. We don't need classrooms. We don't need teachers who are sensitized. This document does mention that we must be sensitive to gender, we must be sensitive to disability, but we must not be sensitive to caste oppression. Caste is simply not mentioned once or twice, I think the word is mentioned, but in passing. My point is, if you are going to have a concept of merit in a society which is as unequal as Indian society is, so unequal, that as I said right at the beginning, 86% of our Bahujans are not more than 86% of the Bahujan sections of Indian society. Out of that section, less than 10% are able to clear class 12. Less than 10% of Bahujans even reach the stage of higher education. And you want to deny them affirmative action? to try and see that even that less than 10% is not able to attend higher education. There is no concept of merit which ignores caste oppression, which ignores patriarchy, which ignores tribal marginalization, which ignores communalization of Indian society, which ignores linguistic and regional dominance, we cannot have a concept of merit which ignores these things. And I am proud to say that as a member of the Jawaharlal Nehru University Student Union in 1972, we, the Students' Union and the university authorities, thanks to uh, a uh, fairly progressive situation at that time, we evolved the, uh, the uh, education policy, the admission policy for JNU, which is responsible for JNU's character. Otherwise JNU would have been like any other, um, uh, it would have been like any other elite university catering to a very small section of uh, elite students, but because we insisted that issues of educational discrimination had to be taken into account so that you had to give weightage, a system of weightages was introduced for admission. And along with that, a student faculty committee was set up in every um, department and every center so that admissions would be finalized by the student faculty committee. So that you have both affirmative action and democratization of the structure of the university admissions policy. 
we really implemented the Kothari Commission's report. And I think that is the important thing for us to remember today. We are not to talk of merit, which drops from the skies. Merit is something which shows you how people actually emerge out of the, the obstacles set in their path by society how they overcome these obstacles and then emerge as people who can contribute to the growth and transformation of society according to the constitution. If we are not going to transform society, then we are not going to be able to develop the society which the constitution has placed before, which the vision of the society which the constitution places before us, liberty, equality, fraternity, secularism, socialism, these ideas cannot come if we are not willing through the education system to transform society and to provide agency to those sections of the society who have been denied the right to transform their own condition. And by acquiring the right to transform their own conditions, they contribute to the transformation of this inegalitarian society of which we, to which we have been subjected for centuries. They contribute to the transformation of this in a manner which was envisaged by the constitution. I think, you know, uh, I can stop here for now. A concept of merit which involves affirmative action, a concept of autonomy which is meaningless without complete academic autonomy of the teachers and the students and of the university vis-a-vis -vis other competing interests in society. It is these two concepts which are the most important if we are to try and realize that society which was envisaged by the constitution. And it is in this way alone that an education policy can do what the Radha Krishnan, Krishnan Commission and the Kotari Commission tried to do and which I'm sorry to say the NEP 2020, the path had already been seen a little earlier in the 1986-92 uh, policy, but it was just about showing itself. But in the 2020, in the 2020 NEP, we don't see anything of the Radha Krishnan Commission. We don't see anything of the uh, uh, Kothari Commission. We don't see anything of the role that was given to the universities in transforming society. What we have in the NEP 2020 is a university system which has been completely commercialized, marketized, privatized, and therefore put out of the reach of over 86% of our population. This cannot give us the society which the constitution had envisaged for us. I think I'll stop here now and we can take up other issues in the process of question answers. Thank you. So, yeah, uh, th thank you, Professor Nandika sir. So uh, we'll go on with the question and answer session now. So I think people who may have questions, uh, you can kindly use the raise hand, or raise hand option. So you should be able to see it in the bottom right of your screen. Okay. So there should be a raise hand option at the bottom uh, right of your screen. So if uh, people can use that and use this raise hand, we can. I can actually unmute those pe uh, people and then they can raise that, uh, They can raise their respective questions. So yeah. Uh, uh, 
you can ask even any of the specific issues that you may have wanted to raise. You can ask those also. Ma'am, I have a question actually. So, um, the thing is actually when, when, when uh, in 1947, the Republic was being set up. So, we, we, we had an idea, we had ideas, ideas of actually setting up public uh, sector industries and we, but when it comes to IIT specifically, we had the idea that, okay, so these are the people who are going to go develop their knowledge and go into the nation building process. But then what happened, what happened around the 90s, the late 80s was that the, uh, the, the whole idea of actually uh, industrializing the country oh, indigenously in a self-dependent way has now been handed over. Now been handed over to the uh, global uh, corporate forces. But today, so you can, and now actually that is happening in a very vigorous way. So all this trajectory can clearly see from the way IITs are actually functioning. So when the people from here are going uh, dominantly in public sector industries are contributing back to the academia, now there's a whole bunch of people now going into the uh, big consultancies, finance groups, big tech corporations and all that. So the, the intellectual output of such public institutes in our country, the, 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 the path of these intellectual output has actually been changing in parallel to the country's change, the country's vision of itself being changing. And now, I think today what is happening is that today when the, in the name of self-dependence, actually that's the most ironic word I would say, most the most self-contradicting word we have said. In the name of self-dependence, this process of actually opening up our economy, opening up the uh, levers of our economy to the global co uh, corporates, now this is being kind of taken towards this natural extension and this is actually now playing it into the education. So in this process, so how do you see when it comes to centrally funded institutes, particularly like IITs, uh, what kind of reservation policies do you think will still exist in these countries, these are existing the institutes? Ma'am, you are not audible. Can you? Uh, I think you are not audible. Hello. Hello, ma'am. Uh, you are not audible. I think maybe some uh, Android connection, maybe. Yeah. yeah, now we are. Hello. Can I hear? Can you hear yes. me? Yeah. Now we are audible. All right, yeah. all right. Yeah. Now, what I'm saying is, you see, in, in uh, society, uh, the education system is uh, something which is conceived of and developed uh, within uh, the, uh, the direction which your society has taken. And uh, we have to make a distinction now. We have to realize that, the, uh, that what we were intending to do in 47, 48, when we, when we became uh, uh, independent, our conception of society, you're very right, was of self-reliance, was of uh, an uh, industrially uh, self-reliant uh, economy and an economy which could use its own human resources and its own, in fact, we didn't use the word human resources then. That came in in the 1980s, late 80s, it came in. But we thought that we could allow our people to, uh, to uh, develop their own talents. And in the process of developing their talents, they would be able to contribute to the development of our society. Along with that, the government was itself working on uh, issues of uh, developing the public sector, which was to be the base uh, of your independent development. 
and uh, your self-reliant development, the commanding heights of the economy were to be in the public sector and uh, major social services like education, health, public utilities, etc., were all supposed to be, uh, were all part and parcel of the public sector. They were not privatized. But in the uh, late 80s and early 90s, particularly in the 90s, with the when the government decided to take on the neoliberal reforms program, that neoliberal reforms program led to uh, initially a gradual, but then in the last 10 years or so, uh, less than 10 years, in the last six years, we've seen a very, very rapid privatization of all aspects of uh, um, uh, India's economy and society. In fact, in just in this period of the lockdown, we are seeing the privatization of electricity, the privatization of uh, um, the railways, the disinvestment in major, uh, in uh, the disinvestment of Air India, in the uh, aviation sector. So a lot of these uh, ideas, uh, and of course, the privatization and commercialization of education and health, which actually health, we have seen what has happened with the COVID crisis, that uh, the very fact that you uh, were, uh, in fact, increasingly privatizing health led to a lot of problems where you did not have enough uh, health workers to deal with the, even now you don't, I mean, we may not hear about it, but anyone who has any contact with people who are working in this sector is very well aware of the problems that are being faced. And these problems are not just being faced in a country like India, countries like a country like uh, America, which has privatized all its, uh, which has the private sector operating in all its, uh, um, uh, its uh, um, uh, social sectors like health and education, etc. America is facing huge problems. In fact, their death rate is higher than almost anywhere else in the world. And their rate of uh, infection also is very high. So, Although this has been seen in, in, in India, we are seeing this, that we are moving very rapidly towards this kind of uh, 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 idea. And we, uh, uh, when we begin to privatize what we once called the commanding heights of our economy, then what happens is that the ability to create jobs the ability to attract the best talent from among your own trained personnel goes down because your control over the economy is limited. In fact, now I think we could say with um, a little bit of sarcasm, but with not too much of a pinch of salt, that today it is not our government which controls industry or which can regulate industry and pull in industry into um, this uh, societal crisis, health crisis that we are faced with. I think today what is very clear is that it is industry. It is the corporate sector and within the corporate sector, the very concentrated monopoly corporate sector, that is the sector which is controlling the government. I mean, I don't know, maybe uh, you people have seen this too, but in the last week or, or 10 days, the, uh, uh, the uh, six airports have been disinvested and handed over to Adani Industries. They've been leased to Adani Industries for I think 50 years or something like that. So, you have a small section of the corporate elite. You have a concentration of wealth increasingly, which we have not seen uh, in the earlier phases of our society. In the last um, six, seven years, this process had begun, but in the last six, seven years, it has pr proceeded at a great pace. 
And in this situation, obviously then, the IITs also, what is happening with the IITs? You are now saying that we have to increase. After all, those who are getting coming out with IIT degrees, they are not contributing. We don't need them to contribute to um, India's uh, future development and the growth of scientific temper and so on and so forth. In India, these people are going to get fancy uh, corporate jobs. So let them pay one and a half lakhs, two lakhs. Let them pay as uh, fees. This is happening in all the private, uh, in all the uh, um, uh, uh, elite uh, institutions which were earlier public funded like the IITs, the IIMs and uh, the engineerings and so on. This is happening to all of them. Medical, of course, medical and health, uh, the medical and uh, this thing is law is at the moment a little separated from this, but all of them are being brought under one uh, uh, um, sort of uh, a single window regulator the National uh, uh, Council, this is the National Higher Education Regulation Commission. This National Higher Education Regulation Commission is a single window for anyone wanting to invest capital in any particular form of higher educational institution. So it doesn't matter if you want to invest in undergraduate education, if you want to uh, invest in postgraduate education, if you want to uh, invest in uh, research institutions, if you want to uh, invest in anything else. All you have to do is you have to, you have a, the National uh, 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 Higher Education Regulation Commission. What it does is it has all the, the physical assets and the details of the degrees, etc., the amount of land, the amount of well, who are the teachers, where are they trained, etc., all this is put online. So if I'm an investor, I just have to look at that whole thing and I say, okay, I don't want to invest in this, I want to invest in that, I want to invest in that institution. And then accordingly, I apply online to the regulator and the regulator, single window regulator, clears me and I can invest. Already, if you go on, uh, uh, on, uh, uh, the, on Google, you will find the number of corporates who have welcomed the single window regulator in uh, higher education. I think all institutions of higher education and all teachers and students unions uh, and student communities have been very uh, agitated by this because they find that there is uh, uh, all benefits are being given for ease of doing business, but little benefit is being given for ease of academic advance. And that is why there is also a little, there's also uh, great unhappiness about the fact that there is absolutely no space for democratic collective bargaining or debate or uh, the role of students and teachers in taking up issues of uh, the universities and the conditions of the students and the teachers. There is no space, there's no democratic space. There is no way in which you can actually question the authorities on what is happening because such democratic space is not being provided for in the NEP 2020. You have boards of governors who are boards of governors who are, uh, they are, uh, it's uh, economic interests the investors and uh, other uh, management interests, and of course, some academics. But you can see that when the funding is private, then it's not going to be the academics who are going to determine it. It's going to be the financial experts and the managerial, uh, the management experts who are going to be the people who are going to be handling uh, how and where uh, the universities are going to 
go because our whole view of society and our whole view of the economy has changed yeah. 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 that is why you know we have been asking for reservation even in the private corporate sector which fits in with my idea that we should have a concept of merit which includes reservation so it doesn't matter whether you're a private institution or a public funded institution the concept of merit that you deal with must take into account the centuries of uh, discrimination against large majority of your population okay 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 so there is one more question so i think geeta can uh, uh, ask the question yeah hello geeta yeah hi kaushik can you hear me this is milan yeah. kaushik sorry omel yeah yeah hello sir hello sir yeah, i mean i'm logging through yeah. uh, geeta's login but it's uh, it's milan dear uh, professor prasad uh, my name is milan i i teach at the iit madras and yeah. uh, uh, thank you very much for a very very enriching talk and and actually i i was very glad that you went back to the radha krishna commission and the kothari commission uh, and uh, the the entire definition of autonomy as given in the kothari commission i think that was very important to actually have it spelled out because that is one of the uh, as you read through the new education policy 2020 you realize that it is as you rightly put the autonomy is basically being um, being uh, equalized with a kind of standardization a kind mm. of procedural standardization and uh, one of the things I, i mean you pointed out some of the contradictions uh, in the report i think one of the contradictions with respect to autonomy is also uh, the setting up of something called the national research foundation or something like that which is going Absolutely. to identify areas of research i mean this is research is such a specialized uh, field and uh, if you talk about autonomy then research Absolutely. would be one of the first i mean research and pedagogy of course yes. but research would be one of the first things where autonomy is entirely given to uh, to the respective uh, student cohorts and the faculty um, yeah. i think it's also very important the point that you made uh, that uh, this the granting of this autonomy actually is not a granting of the autonomy it is an obligation that society has towards its education system so yeah. that it may actually grow in a in a in a certain vision so yeah. um, i i just wanted to point out that or uh, and wanted to uh, have your views on this national research foundation also which which is um very um, its its role is not very clearly defined but it is there in in the mix in the any yeah, yeah. so you it, know it's yeah. it's uh, if i may I uh, uh, intervene it's nothing is very clear in this document because it keeps coming and going as i said and sometimes something is there and sometimes it's not there now for example the national research foundation to my mind is a very problematic uh, body because it funds individual researchers and uh, it uh, not only funds researchers it also evaluates the quality of their research and it also promotes the research which it has uh, paid for so you have <coughs> a very uh, it seems to be like a sort of uh, a vicious circle the researcher is unable to get out of the nrf's vicious circle once you accept in order to accept their funding you have to accept their conception and it you have been actually told that when it comes to national interest it's not just the national research foundation it is the central government which will be the deciding factor now i cannot think of anything i mean that's why i gave the example of columbia university and the bmw because if the person who's paying for your bread and butter and that has been actually the disaster in american uh, uh, research that is why american research does not have the uh, the credibility which uh, research particularly in the uk had 
in between, they also tried to privatize. And after seeing the impact, they immediately went, went back to public funding. They said, no, you can't do this. You can't have industry. Industry will never allow you to uh, work against itself. And um, so um, I think the NRF is again part of this uh, anti-democratic, anti-academic, as you very correctly pointed out, if anybody should decide on what is to be researched and how it's to be researched, it's the researcher. The researcher must have the freedom to research the areas which they think are important. There's another problem in this uh, NEP, uh, I, uh, I'll, uh, which is that this time in the pages that have come to us, the Rashtriya Shiksha Ayog is not mentioned. But while it is not mentioned, it is also not mentioned that it has been removed. And there is also the case, they've talked about strengthening CABE. But there, as you said, we don't know how CABE is to be strengthened. I suspect CABE is going to be uh, integrated into the advisory council, which oversees the Higher Education Commission of India. I suspect that is what is going to happen. But then this is my suspicion, because the document gives you nothing. Sorry, you were about to say. Uh, just about research, what I wanted to say was, I mean, yes. we, do have, we do have a separate uh, entity called, a phenomenon called sponsored research, which is, yes. which is also, I mean, industry needs it, academics do it, it is, it happens, yes. that's fine. But I think uh, primarily the autonomy given to a central university or any academic Any university. Any university is something that is that society owes to that particular institution and to itself. And, and I think that- And to itself, you're quite right, to itself. And that, that conception, I think, uh, seems to have kind of diluted or has been diluted out of uh, a document as important as an education it's been, policy. It's been pushed under the carpet so that we forget yeah. about it. We can use many metaphors, but yeah. I, mean, I would just like to say yeah. it's, it's getting right. diluted, that's all. You're very right. Thank you. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, thank, thank you, Professor Milan, for uh, your questions and uh, Professor Mother Prasad for your answer. So uh, I think there's one more. Yeah. So uh, so I think uh, Priyan wanted to ask a question. Priyan, uh, I think you can unmute yourself. You can go on and ask your questions. Priyan, you there? Hello? Uh, uh, hello. Okay, so I think that let's look at some questions from the Facebook. So we're also streaming the event live on Facebook. Yeah. So then, then uh, from the Facebook. So yeah, the question is: the draft seems to have thrown a lot of light on the so-called choice. Uh, the draft seems to have thrown a lot of light on the so-called choice rather than access. Finance of the terms multidisciplinary, etc., etc., be a testimony of it. On the other hand, there is no proposal of extending the right to education. So, you have thoughts on this? Well, uh, the last point, just to uh, refer to it and then to move on. Uh, yes, there is no talk of uh, uh, extension. Earlier, the document had said that we will extend the right to education to age three on one side and on the other side, extend it up to uh, 18, age 18. Now there is no reference to the extension of the right to education. Does that mean, could that mean that education is no longer being looked upon as a right? Because the Unni Krishnan judgment of the Supreme Court of 1993 made the right to education a fundamental right. And every fundamental right, the state is responsible for ensuring. I suspect that the right to education, the reference, the lack of reference to the Right to Education Act for all its 
weaknesses and uh, for all the criticism that one can make of it, it did do one thing. It recognized that education is a right. And if education is a right, then the state is responsible for providing it. You cannot leave the individual family or the individual student to provide for education for themselves, which is what is happening now with the commercialized concept of education. But now uh, this is uh, a problem. The second thing is multidisciplinary and the issue of uh, um, uh, choice. Choice. Choice, no? I think that was... Uh, yes, yeah. the choice, yeah. that's what the word... The you see, we are told that uh, we have... Uh, we are going to have these mega universities and these mega colleges which will have not less than 3,000 uh, students and could go up to 10,000, 12,000 uh, students, etc. And they will offer an enormous range of courses that you can adopt and enormous range of courses which you can adopt and you will have a system of choice based uh, credit courses. Okay. So that you will collect, you will have a credit bank in which you will collect credits depending on the courses that you choose. But we all know and I'm referring to Delhi University, where I worked for almost 40 years and uh, where um, choice was never of the student or rather the choice for the student was limited because the choice was actually of the institution. Which courses will you offer? Which course, for which courses will you have? faculty. And even in the States, this happens. You have courses, but you may not have faculty for that particular semester. Or there may not be enough students opting for that course for faculty to be provided. So that, let us say, if two students have chosen or opted for a course, but the minimal faculty, uh, the minimal requirement for faculty is, let us say, five, then it means the choice of those two students is no longer a choice. And yet they have given up their right to a non-commercialized university in the name of choice. You see, this multidisciplinary and this choice are very closely linked. Multidisciplinary is not really from what I have gathered and whatever little I could get from this, from these documents and reading them to the extent that we can. Also the kind of uh, um, uh, course options which are offered. You have academic, you have vocational, you have professional, you have uh, arts. Everything is, it's a, it reminds me of a shopping mall. You know, when I go to my local shopkeeper, or when I go to my local market, I do have a lot of options, but not as much as when I go to the mall. So in the mall, I have a lot of options, but that does not mean that the commodities or the uh, being uh, physically put in one place does not make them multidisciplinary. Multidisciplinary is only the uh, shopping mall, uh, what is on the shelf. But it does not mean that the uh, the offers are related to each other in a multidisciplinary way. Multidisciplinary is a way of conceiving of education differently. And there is a lot of talk of Takshashila and Nalanda and our ancient universities, but it is so ahistorical that it leaves me absolutely astonished. There is no mention of the fact that both Takshashila and uh, um, uh, Nalanda and many of our other uh, 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 
multidisciplinary institutes of that ancient period, some of them are in uh, what is now Pakistan, that those were all Buddhist institutions. All Buddhist institutions which were specifically opposed to caste discrimination, to differentiation and oppression of people on the basis of caste and gradually, because it is difficult to be egalitarian in one area and not in another, gradually they took on patriarchy as well. And it is for this reason that at that time they drew scholars from all over the world. And let us not forget that all over the world that we're talking about, whether it be from uh, Japan, China, uh, and uh, uh, Southeast Asia, and, and Burma, and Malaysia, and right down to here, and then up this way to uh, Central Asia, and right up to what would later be Iran. This was the civilized world at that time. They were not the colonized, ex-colonized third world. So let us be, let us realize that today we are not in the situation in which we were then. And if we want to become, if we want to become uh, a, a knowledge power again, if we want to become a society which is self-reliant and independent, then we should not be copying other people's models or copying, looking at other people's, uh, um, um, uh, you know, other countries, uh, 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 sort of models of, 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 you know, their standards of what is high and what is low. We should not be looking at those. We should be developing our own. Because these are the same countries that actually uh, colonized us and subordinated us and our learning as well to their models. So by following that subordinated model, we cannot become independent. Takshashila and Nalanda require first and foremost, and I think this is something very important, our education systems and our ways of thinking cannot move forward if we do not handle the question of rank inequality in our society. If we do not take on this question, which our NEP does not even mention, we are not looking, we are not realizing what it means to be, to be subordinated to a jativad, to be subordinated to an idea that you are born high or low. And then we want to have a Nalanda or a Takshashila. I'm sorry, it's not going to happen. No matter how many times they bring out these documents, it's not going to happen. You have to, the constitution talks of liberty, equality, fraternity. Those three concepts means we have to cope with caste. We have to cope with patriarchy. We have to cope with uh, with problems of gender, we have to cope with problems of disability because these are all ways which destroy fraternity, which deny us equality and liberty. And therefore, if we want to have liberty, equality and fraternity, we have to take on these issues. We can't just push them away by talking of SE. DGs, what do they call them? SEDs, socially and economically um, uh, disadvantaged, group. disadvantaged groups. I mean, that is the most amazing terminology that I have ever heard for something which we ourselves have been re re uh, uh, you know, referring to as caste oppression, as patriarchal oppression, as gender oppression, as disability oppression. We are already referring to them. Our university has centers dealing with these issues. 
and now we are saying now we are saying that we should not talk about these things anymore and we will somehow create a level playing field by not talking about caste or gender or disability or transgender or any of those issues inequality of income wealth nothing privilege by not by pretending that those things don't exist and how do we do this pretense by having a centralized so called level playing field i don't buy this level playing field it is not a level playing field when the players come from advantaged disadvantaged privileged oppressed sections of society there can be no level playing field between these categories yeah. yes suhas i see <laughs> Uh, so suppose you can unmute yourself yeah uh if all this was not enough this nep also talks about gifted children a typical very erroneous concept would you please elaborate on that even though you are talking on the higher education this is yeah no what no, i no, thought no. should be discussed also no you see because the idea goes from gifted children in school right through up to gifted exactly that's why in research it goes through the idea is that this is actually you see this is actually continuing the i know process this is continuing the process of uh, uh selecting privileging individuals you decide at a certain age that children are gifted let us say at the age of 11 since they are having they are introducing uh, their first national level test at the end of class 3 at class 3 a child is 11 years of age 8 years of age ma'am yeah 8 huh? years 11 years of, years of age in class 3 because you start with Eight. you start with 3 years in pre nursery now na with yeah. this uh, with this foundational course so in class 3 you are about 11 years of age ma'am 8 years and, of age I, sorry 8 years of age yeah 8 is it 8 yeah uh, yes three. yes you are right you are right you are sorry, right yeah. you are right please go please right. go no no it's it's just yeah now you decide first time at end of class 3 you do uh, a test an all india test let me tell you the results of that all india test are going to be put against your name and that is going to be decide determine whether you are going to be treated as gifted or as not gifted because this test will be repeated again after class 5 and then again after class 8 and then again at class 9 and 10 and 12 and after all these tests you will have to sit for a centralized exam in order to get admission to university a class 12 degree is no longer required or sufficient for you to get admission to university please do not forget the case of anita and the neat exam this is going to be repeated across all forms of higher education because it is not going to be enough for you to have sat for six exams before this and done your 12th class exam what you will be required to do is to sit for an all india exam which will equip you for going into the university or not the whole process of privileging as suhas has very correctly pointed out the process of privileging begins when you're 8 years old i'll go even further if you look at although we are talking only we are not i mean i was supposed to focus on higher education but i don't think you can delink higher education from what is happening earlier the whole thing begins at age 3 please look at the pre nursery you have pre nursery which is anganwadi based 
that is for sarkari government schools you have pre nursery which is for special government schools that is kendriya vidyalayas navodaya vidyalayas sainik schools etc etc those are attached they are not anganwadi based they are attached to the kendriya vidyalaya or the navodaya vidyalaya or the sainik school and so on then you have stand alone pre nurseries stand alone pre nurseries all of us whose parents have paid for our pre nursery uh, admissions know what those mean those are the private nurseries pre nurseries and then there is the private pre nurseries of private schools so the discrimination and the division of students which you are going to see later when the national research foundation decides how its money is going to be given out that begins at the age of 3 continues through the age of 8 through the age of 11 through the age of 14 through the age of 16 18 and right through your higher education so you are constantly discriminating and dividing i uh, i think uh, suhas had one more question i think yeah. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. I just want to add that yeah. uh, because I am associated with the tribal children, Absolutely. the lack of nutrition and the socio-economic stress also leads to the children's performance, yeah. and this is one way of uh, all the time pushing them that you are not worth it. Yes, and yes. and unnecessarily promoting the privileged classes. Yes, yes. This is what hurts me, and I always talk to the tribal children and huh. try to uh, underline this because this is why I am. This is why I have to listen in the school that yeah. tribals are not worth it. Yeah, but you see, this is why this is why I said so hard. Yeah, the I basis think. of a uh, of uh, uh, an education policy. <laughs> it's Which very it's really universalize and provide access is to have a concept of merit which includes reservation it's it's a very uh, very planned discrimination yes, and yes yes lowering the self image of the absolutely. disadvantaged children absolutely absolutely i couldn't agree with you more leading to dr pyles hanging yeah 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 pal yeah. tadvi yes yes i remember and the kind of thing that happened with with uh, uh, anita what happened with um, uh, rohit let's begin from the beginning i mean when i read rohit's uh, that letter that note which he i mean as a teacher of 40 years standing it broke my heart i would have given my right arm for a student like that but he was told that you are not good enough and we'll make sure that you are not good enough because we'll deny you the scholarship which is your due and because we can't take it away from you because of your your merit we'll take it away from you by simply not giving it to you on time you know this is the way that casteism works that patriarchy works this is the way that communalism works and normal body theory works in the same way too we have to recognize this so we have to have a concept of merit which can take into account oppression otherwise we are in serious trouble uh, i think yeah. professor milin has a question yeah. professor milin please go on yeah i am uh, uh, first of all grateful to suhas kollekar for having brought up uh, having given this discussion this turn because i think the entire issue of something special for gifted children in the nep is really disturbing i mean disturbing i already have scholarships and all that that so called gifted yeah. children can get and they're gifted on one particular parameter of so called merit mm-hmm. and, but it's okay i mean that that exists can now again you want to add to it and make something more uh, for so called gifted children is is again it, it's a, it's contradictory to the policy's own uh, uh this thing uh, of being 
something to promote fraternity, something to promote, you know, constitutional exactly. values, etc. So that is on, on one thing. The other, the other problem also is this entire regimentation of the child's uh, development from yes. age three. Yes. It also means, and this has been one of the things that I've been uh, saying very often, even in the context of higher education institutions like the IITs, for example, that it is very important for students to have unstructured time. Yes. And what we see now is right from age three. I mean, this is really, I think Krishna Kumar said it very well that, I mean, it, it is the most distressing thing for him that now children will be under tension from age three. <laughs> that is something I said. Now, now you want to structure the time from age three. That is, I think, uh, really very problematic. It, simply from the point of view of, um, of uh, child pedagogy or, you know, um, yeah. early childhood pedagogy. Um, so I, I, I feel, I just want to say that there are these very, uh, very obvious contradictions within the formulations of the education policy as such that, and the last point I want to make is since we have, uh, we have talked a lot about the idea of merit being, of course, an idea of merit, which, which, uh, which includes uh, the dimension of caste oppression, of gender oppression, etc. I also feel that um, when, when we look at, for example, the affirmative action uh, situation in the US and uh, the incorporation of race into, uh, into that, it, it should not basically mean a co-opting of, of, uh, of members of marginalized communities, if for want of a better word, into the existing idea of merit. I, I exactly. don't think that, I think it is, it is also very important to democratize the idea of merit itself. Merit what itself. Merit, since, uh, you know, what knowledge means. So uh, that is tribal precisely children, my point. for example, there are so many knowledge systems that, that we need to also be aware of and things like that. So I, I feel that not only should we definitely, of course, we have to incorporate or be sensitive and et cetera, et cetera, about the various, uh, various kinds of oppression that have been perpetuated in, in this world. Uh, but we also have to be uh, a little more open about what merit is in its in yes. itself per se. You know, the, so that's what I want to just note. And yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you for giving the discussion this direction to us for later. <laughs> thank you. I, your, your interventions have been, have, has been very, very uh, uh, enlightening. And uh, you're right that it is, we have to, we have to actually create a concept of merit, which does not equate merit with privilege. That is what we have at the moment. So if you're male, English speaking, well to do, you're meritorious. I mean, that, that we have to uh, blow this idea and that is where we really look at, at learning because this whole strategy, which is now being promoted as learning pedagogy, which I, I, I really have serious problems with this and that requires a whole debate on its own, is this concept of learning outcomes. What is a learning outcome? How can you decide before the learning process has begun where the learning process must end? So you have predetermined what is merit, what is achievement, what is learning. And the actual process of learning has been thrown out of the window. For example, if I'm going to talk to two students, let's say I, I put a, a question before uh, uh, two students. There was once discussing uh, a, a, a literary text. I used to often give, I taught philosophy, but I gave my students a lot of things uh, uh, to, to actually cope with and analyze before we could understand it. When you look at the whole thing of how do people respond to certain situations? What does somebody, what I do not require, uh, uh, regard as inequality, somebody else will regard as inequality. What my, even my husband does not understand or accept as being uh, uh, discriminatory, I as a woman, as part of this whole structure of uh, 
um, the man woman the gender relationships within um, predominantly hindu or predominantly religious communities uh, in india i know how uh, uh, how gender oppression works in fact i think my greatest achievement as a teacher was the day when my i heard my husband telling somebody else that look you know let's not talk about gender oppression because you can't understand what gender oppression is you've never been through it so this is what i say when my in my class when i have in in the physical classroom and this is why i'm opposed to this idea of online education replacing physical classroom education also there are all these other factors that come in in my class if i have a student if i have students who have experienced oppression and this oppression comes through generations whether it is gender whether it is uh, uh, caste whether it is uh, um, wealth whether it is uh, uh, disability this oppression comes through generations i remember you know how how upset um, uh, disabled students get when you say what are you blind by by which you mean you haven't seen what there is to see so similarly you you uh, when uh, 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 girls don't speak up in class because they think that uh, the boys should speak first you know there are we keep seeing these things operating now if a sister an education system cannot take this into account then that is very stupid i remember taking this exercise with my students i used to ask my students every year if in school they had any scheduled caste or scheduled tribe friends because most of the people who come to university since less than 10% of the bahujans make it to the university most of the people who came to the university came from schools which were private normally or good schools or kenji vidyalayas or something and i found that um, they would invariably think 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 and then they say no and then i would ask them when did you first make friends with a scheduled tribe or scheduled caste uh, friend and their immediate response would be with their eyes opening wide they would say ma'am in college and why in college because of reservation because they were there that's why you could be friends with them and this whole you know we don't understand how pervasive these uh, oppressions are and these discriminations are they are so pervasive that if we do not bring one a heterogeneous group into the classroom that's why i am also opposed to the kind of uh, admissions this centralized admission i think the most horrific thing will be the centralized uh, admission test because then you only bring one kind of student into the classroom and nothing is as dull or as boring as a classroom into which only one kind of privileged clientele comes in you need the heterogeneity and this is something which i think all educationists accept and recognize that you need the heterogeneity of society to be reflected in the classroom and only then can the classroom really cope with and transform and become the basis of a new kind of social order and one which was envisaged in our constitution but if we are already going to discriminate and get rid of them through a centralized exam then i'm sorry the nep is not going to take us where the constitution was leading us not at all I think we've been through quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, ma'am. So I, I, uh, I think there's no more questions. So 
uh, yeah, we'll, we'll wind up the session today. So I, I really thank all the audience who have uh, wonderful questions. Suhas, Professor Milan, Gita, and uh, other audience members. And I thank Professor Mukhtar here for uh, coming here and uh, giving her uh, understanding views and uh, critiques on the new education policy, her uh, wide world views on the current reality of the country, current reality of the people, realities of the people. Yeah, realities of the people. So, so yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed this. Thank you. And thank you uh, to uh, Professor uh, uh, Milind and uh, Suhas and the other uh, students who, uh, the other people who were listening. Thank you so much. It's been really, uh, you've given me a very, very fair hearing <laughs> and helped me also organize my own ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Kaushik. Thank you, ma'am. We'll, we'll wind up the event here. Thank you. Yeah. Thank we'll, you. We'll...